I think we can get started here. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nestor Hernandez. I'm an assistant director for student engagement in undergraduate student life. We are so happy that you're able to join us for the sixth, sixth webinar of our 2023 summer webinar series. And we're thrilled to collaborate and co-host this year's webinar series with our colleagues in the Office of Student and Family Support. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, the information discussed today and throughout any of the webinars moving forward is specific to undergraduate student, undergraduate students in Columbia College, uh, Columbia Engineering, and their families. Uh, our panelists will present for about 40 minutes, uh, and then we will leave time at the end for questions. Uh, in the Zoom platform, you'll be able to ask questions using the Q&A submission box. Given the large number of, of participants, in today's webinar. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but if you do have a question, we want you to reach out. Uh, we will also be recording this webinar for families who could not make it, and it will be available on the YouTube channel at Family at Columbia in a few days. But before we get started with today's panel, I want to introduce members of the student and family support team. Uh, here we have the Administrative Coordinator of the Office of Student and Family Support, Joanne Neal. Hi, everyone. Uh, and just so you know, I'm going to be putting a lot of links in the chat. You can uh, copy and paste them or take a picture, but they will also be included in the um, webinar recording, which will be up next week. So um, just know that there'll be access to them, however you'd like that. Thank you. And we have the Director of Student and Family Support, Veronica Bjorkman. I know, sir. Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. The Associate Dean of Student and Family Support, Matthew Potashnik. Everyone, good morning. Nice to see you all today. And now I'd like to welcome our panelists, and I will ask them each to introduce themselves as I call their names. Uh, first, we have Dean Lisa Halibaugh from Columbia College. Thanks, Nestor. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Halva, Dean of Academic Affairs for Columbia College. Uh, academic Affairs is the general phrase we use for the areas that support the academic experience of all of our students. Our work includes collaborating with faculty on the courses they develop and the way they teach and advise our undergraduates in their fields. Um, our work also supports a very special set of courses, the courses that make up the core curriculum, which every Columbia College student has to take in order to graduate. We recruit over 200 instructors, support their work, mount hundreds of small sections, and support the students as they take these courses. We also provide guidance on opportunities that allow students to pursue their academic interests outside the classroom through research or fellowship opportunities. And as you'll hear from one of my colleagues on this webinar, we provide academic advising for all of our students. Um, most of our academic affairs offices are located in 202 Hamilton Hall. I hope you'll come by to see us and I'm happy to be here to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Awesome. And we have, and second, we have Adriana Reyes from Columbia Engineering. Hi hey everyone, good morning. My name is Adriana Reyes and I am the Associate Director of Undergraduate Student Affairs for Columbia Engineering. Uh, I am part of our larger engineering student affairs team. So we really work um, with all of our students right now during NSOP until you graduate to support you in really all facets of your time at Columbia. Um, I also work very closely with our engineering deans in areas like study abroad, academics, research, um, and just making sure your overall college experience goes well. So happy to be here. Thank you. And next we have Dean Angie Carrillo from the Barrick Center of Student Advising. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Again, my name is Angie Carrillo, Associate Dean in the Barrick Center for Student Advising, or CSA for short. I am one of a team of 29 full-time professional advisors here to help you. We primarily guide Columbia College and Columbia engineering students through their academic journeys at Columbia. This includes helping students selecting courses each term, choosing a major concentration in the college or a major possible minor in, in Columbia engineering. That we also help with short-term and long-term goals during your time at Columbia and beyond. We have already had a pleasure meeting with some of you in one-on-one -on -one advising appointments and group advising sessions that have happened uh, in the past two weeks. And we look forward to connecting with all other incoming students soon to help prepare everyone for the upcoming fall term. 
Thank you. And additionally, we have two students joining us today. Uh, first, we have Paige Laurie from Columbia College. Hi, everyone. My name is Paige Laurie. Um, I'm a rising junior in Columbia College studying sociology, and I'm one of the student coordinators on the NSOC committee. And we have Anthony Ayala from Columbia Engineering. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Anthony. I am a rising junior as well uh, in Columbia College or, or at Columbia Engineering, also known as CS. Uh, so a lot of students will refer to as. Um, I'm studying biomedical engineering, and I will be one of the orientation leaders this and sub cycle. So with that, I will turn it over to Paige for our first question. Great. Thank you, Nestor. So as an incoming first year, I thought I knew exactly what the core curriculum entailed. But as I arrived and actually began taking courses, I realized there's so much more to the core than students initially think. Not only is there literature humanities, also known as lit hum and university writing, but there are also global requirements and art and music history courses that I was entirely unaware of. So this curriculum looks very different between Columbia College and C's, but at least in my experience, I also felt a little intimidated by the core as I registered for classes because it can be really hard to choose between courses that explore potential majors and getting a head start on the core. It was all really exciting, but also really overwhelming, and it took some time for me to find a good balance. So I was wondering if you, Dean Hollabaugh, could explain a bit more about how core classes really work during a student's first year in Columbia College and how to best go about balancing your core requirements and exploring potential majors and concentrations. Thank you, Paige. Uh, that's a great, great question and a really big question because it pretty much touches on um, all the aspects of your studies at Columbia and how to start them. Um, so let me break it down and I'll start with your question about the core curriculum in particular. And here you'll, you'll see a series of, of um, websites go up. And the first one is a website devoted to our core curriculum because as Paige said, it is quite large. And there are lots of courses that students have to take to fulfill the core curriculum requirements. Some of them are what I call shared courses. They're the courses that every student take sometimes together at the same time, the entire first year class, the entire sophomore class, sometimes at different times, but you're studying the same thing as everyone else who has taken literature humanities or contemporary civilization, art humanities, music humanities, frontiers of science, university writing. Um, then there are what we might call distribution requirements, where we ask you to round out your general education by being exposed to scientific ways of thinking and a science requirement or foreign language or what we call our global core requirement, where you study other regions of the world um, in, to complement the, um, the shared courses in the core curriculum. And there you have choices uh, from among hundreds of courses. So there is a lot to go through and there are lots of choices to make, but we will help you get started by making sure that you are in literature humanities, university writing and frontiers of science in your first year. And even that alone, as Paige said, will have a lot of work entailed, will be a lot to get used to. And so let me just say one thing about uh, those core courses, and I teach literature humanities, so that's particularly near and dear to my heart. Um, as Paige was saying, one of the things that you will be doing your first year of college is getting used to the workload, getting used to the amount of reading you have, the amount of assignments you have, it will feel very different from most of you from high school. And so that adjustment is not something that happens overnight. It's something that takes pretty much the entire year. You want to work closely with your instructors to have them help you think about the way that you're approaching your work, the way you're strategizing your work. And I will let you know ahead of time, um, with literature humanities, for example, you're looking at some really significant works from throughout history. And some of them are quite large. Some of them are quite long. And we move through them very quickly. And it can be, to use Paige's phrase, very daunting uh, to keep up with all of this, but that is the way the course is constructed for a reason. We're not trying to spend a lot of time going deeply into each text, although we hope you'll get a chance to return to them many times, but we're looking at how the ideas in these texts accumulate and respond to one another. It's about a conversation among the texts across history. So you're going to want to move through them quickly and your instructors can help you figure out what the best strategy is for doing that. And don't forget your classmates, your roommates, other people in your hall, will also be taking these courses at the same time. So comparing notes with them about how you make these adjustments, I think can be really, really useful. And I will say that we hear from alumni all the time that one of the most valuable things that they learned among all of the valuable things that they learned in their Columbia education was from the core for this reason, how to take in so much information, go through so many pages and digest them and figure out what you need to know that's important to you, that you need to know for yourself, that you need to share out with other people. I have talked to alumni in finance, in law, in medical research, in screenwriting, across different kinds of careers who have said that these are skills 
that they have carried with them throughout their time at Columbia and beyond. Um, so let me touch on the second part of Paige's question, which has to do with how do you start exploring other parts of your curriculum um, and try to figure out things that you might want to focus on and study in your major or your concentration. And while you will definitely have a literature humanities section in either university writing or frontiers of science in your first semester, students usually take four to five classes per semester. So that means you still have two or three slots to fill your first semester and your second semester. And here is where I will say it is never too early to start looking through the Columbia College Bulletin. The bulletin is the publication that explains um, the curriculum and the policies that every student needs to know and follow in order to earn the Bachelor of Arts degree from Columbia College. And in the bulletin, there are sections for every single department and center and institute that has an undergraduate major or concentration or special concentration. And if you go to those pages, you'll see not only the faculty who are in the department and some of the structure, but you'll see what it takes to fulfill a major, whether there are different sequences you can follow, whether there are specific sequences you must follow so that you should start earlier than later, whether there are uh, different pathways through one particular major. And so you could start reading through all of that now and your advisor will be helping to point you in that direction often when you're having conversations. And there's, so you'll see one of the websites linked is a link to the bulletin. There's also a link on our website to one of our websites that lists every major or concentration or special concentration a student in Columbia College can pursue. And it might be useful to look at that page because that spells out the majors and concentrations. They might, four or five of them might be in one department. If you're looking at the bulletin, it might lead you to a department. But if you wanna see the names of the majors and concentrations, that might be an interesting way for you to start exploring. Then if you click on those links, it will take you to the right part of the bulletin so that you can look through the courses. So if you start looking through those now, if you start talking with your advisor now, then you might have some general overview. And then when you get to campus and you need to make these choices about, do I want to do part more of the core and take a foreign language class as well? Am I a pre-med student? Do I need to start with chemistry and make sure I'm in one of those classes? Do I want to explore something I've never thought of before because they didn't offer it in my high school, like anthropology or environmental biology or philosophy? So those are all great options and they're all choices. So you'll want to come with questions. You'll wanna talk with your advisor. During orientation week, in the middle of the week, we will have what's called the Academic Resources Fair, where there will be a representative from every single one of these programs, both for the college and for engineering. And you'll be able to go from table to table and talk to faculty and other representatives about what it's like to study in those programs. And if you come with even more specific questions because you've looked at the websites and the bulletin, you can get some really targeted information right away that will help you make these choices. And just keep remembering, we will want to talk to you as much as possible to help you through these moments where it will feel overwhelming. Columbia is big, it's busy, there's tons of opportunities and that is a fantastic thing. It can also be an overwhelming thing as Paige said. So please keep talking to all of us now and throughout the year. So I could go on as you can tell, but I will stop here because um, I'd love to ask Anthony and Adriana if they would like to share uh, thoughts about this uh, from the engineering point of view. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Halbaugh, for that great insight. Um, but for CEs, our experience is a bit different than our CC peers. We only overlap about a third to a half of the core classes, and the other two thirds is really centered around the essential, more foundational sciences of all the engineering disciplines at Columbia, such as physics, chemistry, and math, as well as some other courses, uh, such as economics and computer science. Uh, for the first few semesters at Columbia, the engineers are all taking classes together. So. Uh, you'll be taking chemistry, physics, and calculus with students regardless of what they plan to study, uh, which I think is very beneficial. Uh, the introduction of numerous perspectives while working alongside your peers exposes you to a range of engineering disciplines and potential intersections of your set ambitions. And you never know, maybe you'll discover a passion for another field and pivot before C's major declaration your sophomore year, uh, your sophomore fall as well. I, for one, found a passion outside of my own major in machine learning, which I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to explore through extracurriculars and uh, work this past summer. Um, this course structure also allows you to explore non-engineering classes um, you will take as a freshman, um, such as university writing. Uh, this class allowed me to uh, read and discuss topics under an academic lens that was very profound and brought me to inquire about engineering topics with a more inquisitive attitude. 
Um, I also was able to indulge in more consequential topics with my professors through office hours as we discussed their research and its applications to um, the industry and the real world. And it was also prepared me for other humanity focused core classes that I took um, in my following semesters. Uh, because of UW, I confidently took these classes on expansive topics that interested me uh, and not just what things I want to or was required to take. Um, despite much of the class structures being out of my comfort zone, because I'm a very mathematical student, uh, I discovered that I enjoy working with topics that have no definite right or wrong answers. Um, because an argument was always able to be made. Uh, overall, the Columbia Engineering Corps also allows you to have the more holistic education, which gives you an edge moving forward onto life. In the light of this, Adriana, do you have any other thoughts on how to approach the balance between um, the core curriculum and the engineering curriculum? and how students can leverage that connection to reinforce their Columbia experience. Um, also, how would you encourage uh, other students to approach their first semester so that they prepare to follow the path for major declaration? Or... Sure, thank you, Anthony. So I think it's important to note for our engineers as well that both the core and the engineering curriculum are such important parts of your time here. It's not just those math and science classes that you're probably thinking about, uh, which seems kind of obvious since you are an engineer, um, even though those are your very foundational courses and what your later engineering courses will really build off of. Um, the humanities in the core really give you that human aspect of being an engineer. And that's also what's really important for us, um, for you to learn during your time here. Um, you know, our vision that you hear a ton more about um, in the coming weeks is engineering for humanity and having that balance between um, the core and the engineering curriculum really helps to bring that balance of both sides together. Because um, when you are out in the real world working as engineers um, in the future, you do have to think about the people and the communities that you are impacting with the work that you are doing as engineers. So the core really helps open you up to learning those kind of topics as well. Um, I think it's also um, kind of like Anthony mentioned, just a great opportunity in the core to explore other interests that you have outside of engineering. Um, I've known a lot of students who come into C's who also have a huge interest in music or performing arts. And they really use some of this time to continue that craft or just learn more about um, you know, things that interest them. So just because you're going into engineering doesn't mean that you can't um, also have those avenues as well. Um, and to talk a little bit more about the engineering curriculum, um, one of the very important classes you'll also take is the art of engineering. And this is what you'll take your first year on campus, um, kind of opposite the semester that you'll take university writing. Um, and this gives you a really great opportunity to learn more about the multiple disciplines within engineering um, and specifically our departments as well. Um, so you get to kind of explore maybe what you want to major in or minor in during this time. Um, and you'll also get the opportunity to work in group projects to meet other students. You'll be part of an expo at the end of the semester you take it where our students will actually build video games for the communities to come test out and play um, in our mud building, um, as well as just learning the ethics of engineering. Um, and then as far as approaching um, your first semester, I would definitely just say the importance of um, really paying attention to those prerequisites and the requirements based on what you are looking at um, learning. So I know there's some links in the chat um, specifically again about the bulletin. So similar to the college, we have our academic bulletin that does also really outline a lot of the same information about requirements, majors, minors, um, all those kind of things as well. Um, and I think that it's a really great time to just review maybe what classes you'll be taking and kind of plan out a couple of semesters as well. Um, we do know that our engineering curriculum is very in depth, but it is designed that way just so you are trained and prepared for whatever that postgraduate time looks like in four years, whether you'll be continuing your education um, or going right into industry. Um, and then I think to just to note something that's already been mentioned by some of our panelists, but this is such a huge time of transition for all of you. Um, so really using that first semester to just make that adjustment, um, finding out you know what your study style is like, college level courses can definitely be very different than high school. Um, and even the smaller things like, are you an 8 a.m. type of person or should you sleep in a little bit more and just take 11 a.m. classes? All of that's really what you'll be learning um, during your first semester and even first year, just adjusting to what Columbia is like. Um, so I think it's also just important to find that time to find that comfort and routine as well. Um, and also just have fun. We know that of course your academics are a priority, but definitely still getting involved and finding that balance as well. Um, and I think with that, it'd also be great to hear a little bit more from Paige about this from the Columbia College perspective um, and to dive in also a little bit about your experience working with your advising dean or your academic advisor. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I mean, one of the things that CC and the College of Engineering have in common is that one of the first resources at Columbia you will have access to is your academic advisor. Um, and at least for me personally, being able to meet with my advisor was one of the best tools I could have used during my first year. I came into Columbia with no idea of what I wanted to major in, as I'm sure many of you uh, will experience. And I had no idea what classes I wanted to take. And they walked me through so many different options and opportunities that made it all feel so much more manageable. Um, and not only did my advisor help me with academics, but I ran into some health issues during the spring and they helped connect me with people and support I needed to keep up with my coursework in a manageable way. So my advisor has always made me feel supported and like I have someone in my corner, no matter what challenges I face at Columbia. So Dean Carrillo, I was actually wondering if I, you could speak a bit about the process that the incoming class can expect from meeting and building this relationship with their advisor and what this relationship would look like in their first year. Thank you, Paige. I'll definitely try to address your question for sure. First, I do want to start by sharing that each of you as incoming students have been officially assigned an academic advisor in the Center for Student Advising, or again, CSA for short. We also use the terms advising dean, um, academic advisor, like I mentioned, CSA advisor. Uh, we um, will start working with you now this summer until you earn your undergraduate degree. You all have received an initial email with the name of your academic advisor, and then that was followed by an email directly from your assigned advisor to show you um, exactly how you would make the initial appointment with your advisor. So if you haven't already, um, I recommend that you make that first appointment um, and know that building the advising relationship, cultivating that advising partnership is the responsibility of, of both the advisor and the student. The sooner we connect, the sooner you will be comfortable to reach out to your academic advisor for both the big and small things and everything in between. Your academic advisor is in addition to the directors of undergraduate studies and other faculty advisors and professional advisors within the academic departments you have access to before and after you declare your major or your concentration or your minor. You can meet with your academic advisor as frequently as you want. We have an online appointment system that you can utilize to find and select times that work best for your schedule. Um, we meet in person, we meet through Zoom, we meet, um, we can talk over the phone. And for sure, if you have quick questions, email correspondence back and forth it is very, very common as well. Although students are not required to see their CSA advisor, we strongly encourage it. It Again, building that strong advising connection takes some effort and time. So whenever we reach out to you, we hope that you also respond and begin to connect with us. As I mentioned in the intro, the role of the advisor is to help, to help students create and accomplish uh, manageable goals. Um, that, you know, we ultimately help students through um, just various options that they have. We are not here to tell students what to do, but we help um, you assess your different options and choices and help you come to a decision that works best for you at a given time. We not only help students with their academics, but also everything else in their lives that may affect their academics. For instance, if a student is having um, transition issues and we and need help connecting, we can talk through ways to help make things better and more manageable. We work closely with our colleagues all across the campus in all of the various offices. And we oftentimes refer our students to these offices, such as Undergraduate Student Life, which includes, of course, Res Life and Student Engagement, and Columbia Health, which in includes Counseling and Psychological Services and Disability Services. In regards to registering for courses for the upcoming first year, um, beyond the pre-registered courses that you have heard um, in, previously in this webinar, that you'd be pre-registered for two courses as a Columbia College student and one course, whether it be art of engineering or university writing as a Columbia engineer, uh, your advisor will help you decide on the classes or the levels of certain subjects in math and science that would complement those pre-registered courses. It's certainly fine to be undecided right now, as Paige mentioned. Nobody needs to know exactly what you would want to do here at this time as an incoming student, unless, of course, you're a combined plan student who comes in with a, with a specific major. Um, but if, if you are undecided, we will work on a course schedule that will allow you to still have various academic options to choose from. You will be registering using our Virgil slash student services online platform. 
and we will work with you and help you um, plan for that registration process in, in these systems uh, before it's time for you to register in a couple weeks. So we hope to get all of your academic advising questions answered well before then. And we look forward to our first meetings with each of the students um, for, the, for advice, to, to build our advising um, relationships. And we look forward to more advising interactions to come. I now have a, a question for our students, Anthony and Paige. What resources have you utilized to help you with your transition to Columbia? Thank you, Dean Carilla. Um, And I actually ended up using a, a, a lot of resources during, especially during my first year, just overall my time here during, at Columbia. Um, and it all have been very beneficial. Um, because I came to Columbia without taking some of the courses uh, that other students did take, um, I was kind of always felt like I was catching up in some cases um, to the other students in my class. And for that, teaching assistants and professors were a really big help to keep up with the curriculum and make sure that I understood the content at a level would, that would benefit me going forward to the more advanced classes in my major. Uh, finding a time to meet with them outside of office hours was just an email away. And other than they also put on stuff like um, the physics TAs, they did what they called the snack itself which uh, was a weekly get together where they would order pizza and then uh, in, they would have us all in the physics lounge and we, they would help us with our problem sets and we were all just up there hanging out doing physics. It's actually really fun. Um, one of my greatest memories I had of my freshman year. Um, and it was basically a class-wide study session. Uh, this was a great place to meet your fellow engineers and grow your relationship with the TAs. Um, and I wanna emphasize that doing anything with other students can only enhance your experience. Um, so kind of get into the more things uh, here, uh, I want to shout out the CSA Tutoring 2, which has been very helpful. Um, this was one of the resources my advisor had referred me to upon sharing my feelings um, in the class, like that way I was feeling in the classroom with uh, catching up, um, because sometimes it's really nice to have um, another student explain the curriculum to you, um, because they can relate it, they can offer you methods on how to properly, um, or how they were able to succeed in the class. Um, so having just like the experience and sharing that experience was um, something that's very helpful. And this kind of leads me into um, my uh, thing. Another thing I wanted to mention was as an FGLI student, there are also programs offered by Columbia that were helpful in guiding me through the transition of different social and academic environments. While that program is offered to FLY students, um, there are places and programs both student and faculty run where you can engage with any communities that you may identify with for academic support and advice uh, for everyone's experience here will be their own and not one to the same. So relating to someone and getting that advice can be a very big plus. Um, and some advice I had received through these resources as well was Virgil and Copa. So which are platforms of registering classes and scheduling your classes. Um, I religiously use Virgil uh, through uh, whenever I have to choose classes because it allows you, it's basically a Google calendar and it allows you to have like an arrangement and you can pick and choose um, any classes you want. Um, and, and it's non-binding because it's not the official registering app. Uh, that is us as well, which you'll have more familiarity with as you move forward. Um, but I look to Virgil to help schedule my planner to see which one actually works for me. And then I also look at Copa to see which class structures look for me because uh, professors um, are what they offer the classes and their professors are always there for help you, but the syllabus is for every class is not the same. So I highly recommend looking at any professor reviews to see how they structure their classes and see if that works also better for you. Um, and like as mentioned before, your advisor is always here to help you. Um, you are, she's already there on their on your academic journey. They will know about the resources at Columbia, which are at your disposal, and are more than happy to answer any of your questions. In my experience, though I did not communicate with my advisor on a daily basis, anytime that I have a question or want to discuss with my schedule, um, she has always been there to meet me either virtually or in person in their learner offices, um, which are very beautiful, by the way. Um, and now uh, I'll pass it on to Paige to share her experience. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to kind of mirror what Anthony said, Columbia has so many free resources available to students um, for anything they need throughout your time, not just as a first year, but as an incoming student in general. So disability services um, and counseling and psychological services, also known as CPS, are incredible resources for students needing emotional support or accommodations. 
uh, the CSA Tutoring Center and your advisor are great for academic needs, and even your instructors and TAs, as Anthony said, can provide support as you need it throughout your time at Columbia. But that being said, there were a lot of resources I never used as a first year, and I really wish I did. I knew a lot of friends who used the Writing Center, for example, during their university writing classes, and while I never thought I needed help with my writing, I realized the support really could have been beneficial for the academic style papers that university writing required that I wasn't quite familiar with in high school. Especially during NSOP and the first few weeks of classes, students are given so many resources that can it, it can be hard to remember which to use when the need arises. So that brings me to my next question. Adriana, Dean Hollabau, and Dean Carrillo, do you have any advice on additional resources for incoming students in their first year at Columbia or thoughts on how to find a balance between the resources that are available? Sure, I can kick us off. Um, so I definitely agree um, with Paige. There are a ton of resources, and I think um, both Paige and Anthony already mentioned a lot of really great ones that will be beneficial to you um, during your first year here at Columbia. Uh, I would really emphasize just building those relationships with the faculty and the staff in those academic departments, especially the ones you're looking at majoring in. Um, they'll really be the ones with you once you declare your major to guide you um, for the rest of your time here, whether it's making sure you're taking the appropriate courses, um, you know, and just really whatever help you'll need academically. And, you know, they're here to make sure that you're successful. So definitely connecting with them is something that's really important. Um, and I would also just say using really your peers, the upperclassmen, the orientation leaders that you'll be connecting with are just a great way to get that student perspective that someone like myself who's staff here may not be able to share. Um, and they can, they're somebody who's really been in the place that you are now of going through NSOP and getting through this transition. So they can give you more of that um, student perspective or even where the best study spots on campus which two classes should i maybe not take in the same semester if it's just a lot of work um, so definitely using them as you are finding um, you know more friends on campus and upperclassmen they're always very willing to help and answer those questions as well um, and as far as the balance i think it's really important just to not feel the need to visit everyone right away or to make appointments with everybody in every office um, you know you have four years here so you'll definitely have that time um, to really explore what resources are beneficial to you and really when you need them. So I think just finding, um, again, that transition time, that comfort in whatever that routine is going to be um, to kind of slowly make your way through them um, is also okay. Um, so I'll pass it now over to Dean Hallabau to also talk about some of those resources. Thank you, Adriana. Um, you've mentioned, several of you have mentioned so many of the great organized resources, if you will. We have the Writing Center, departmental help rooms, uh, the offices um, filled with staff and instructors. So I'll just um, unpack, if you will, what a couple of other people have already said about working with the instructors and the faculty themselves. Um, because you will hear a lot of people advise you to go to office hours and to talk with your instructors. And in fact, you will hear a lot of upper class students tell you, I'm so glad I did it. That is what really helped me understand my classes. But it is sometimes hard for new students to um, get over their shyness or their nervousness in order to do this or to figure out exactly what they want to talk about in office hours, what will be helpful about them. And so I just want to encourage you to start thinking now about how you can plan to go to office hours. Um, every faculty member will have office hours set aside during the week to meet with students in their classes. It will be a couple uh, hours. It will be posted on their syllabus. It should be posted on the website that they have at Columbia so that you know when they should be in their offices ready to chat. And they have these office hours precisely to chat with students. So you are absolutely welcome there when you come by. And then you can go by yourself, you can go in pairs, you can go in small groups with other people from the class. Um, and if you're not sure how to start the conversation, you could always plan in advance by talking to your advisor or talking to classmates about some of the questions you have. Sometimes students are shy to go into a faculty member's office hours because the professor is so impressive and um, accomplished in their field and it can be um, a little intimidating. Sometimes they don't want to seem like they don't understand what's going on in the class. They don't want to seem like they're struggling in the class. And sometimes they just don't know how to start. They don't know what question to ask or how to launch the conversation. So I just want to um, assure you that professors 
assume students will have questions. They've designed these classes, they're Columbia classes, they're rigorous, they're challenging. They are supposed to challenge students and students are likely to have questions, to have moments when they are puzzled or even struggling. And the professors who've designed the classes know what success in those classes look like best. And so they are the best resources to go to. And they will also know about some of these other resources that people have mentioned. Your Lit Hum or Literature Humanities professor may say, let's work on your essay together, but I also encourage you to go to the writing center and work with a writing center tutor to help with some of the details you're asking about and we can work together so that your essay can be as strong as possible. Um, or they may mention something that your advisor can connect you to. Um, so we are all a kind of network. All of us have our one area that we know most about. And then we're very eager actually to bring our colleagues, other faculty, other um, people into the conversation so that you as a student get all the different voices, all the different expertise that you need. I will mention just because it came up, um, uh, Anthony mentioned uh, something called CULPA and I think uh, that someone put a website up there. I will just um, note CULPA is kind of like Rate Your Professor. It's run by students. It's very kind of unofficial, but it has been around for a long time and it's accumulated a lot of uh, responses from students, but it's something where students decide themselves whether they would like to put up some kind of rating. You will get some honest answers. It's a great resource, but I did also want to mention um, Anthony also mentioned Virgil and how important that is. And if you go to Virgil, you will actually be able to access the official course evaluations for many courses so that you see what all the students in a section have said, generally speaking, um, everybody who has uh, put in a response. So just to let you know, there's a lot of voices out there, a lot of people who have, and, and a lot of different styles, as you know. There are people who love one professor and find another professor not as interesting or as available, and it varies from student to student. So again, talk to a lot of people in addition to using all of these resources. Um, so uh, Dean Carrillo, from your vantage point in CSA, what are other resources you might also emphasize? Thank you, Dean Halaba. And during your one-on-one -on -one advising conversations with your CSA advisor or Center for Student Advising Advisor, um, they can recommend some of the many other resources we have within the Center for Student Advising. Um, that uh, we did hear about, one, one of the ones, uh, the resources we heard about were the free tutoring for some of our foundational courses. Um, Anthony and Paige touched upon that. Um, a little bit. We also offer pre-professional advising for students who may be interested in pre-med, pre-law, or pre-business. I did want to um, promote the fact that we do have two pre-health webinars next week for all those considering pre-health professions, so please attend those. They were advertised on the latest Countdown to Columbia email that you received this week and will be on, and it and they are advertised on the Countdown to Columbia website. There is one session for incoming first years and one pre-med session for incoming combined plan and transfer students. The last resource within the Center for Student Advising uh, that I would like to promote is the Peer Academic Skills Consultants. They are a resource that are made up of upper class students who are here to help you build effective learning strategies. The Peer Academic Skills Consultants are, are available to meet with students one-on-one. -on -one. They're trained to help students with time management, test preparation, note-taking, but they're also trained to help with more nuanced issues like imposter syndrome, transferring the transition from high school to college, and stress management, which are the topics most of our students seek help for from the peer academic skills consultants. The important thing that I do want to emphasize and highlight here is that the peer academic skills consultants are not only for the students who seem to be struggling or doing poorly in their class. They are there for students um, for for just any reason, even if, especially if you're doing well and want to do better, um, seeking help out from from all of these resources, including the peer academic skills consultants, are not a sign of weakness or failure. They're available to help you. Um, they could also help um, if you, as Dean Hollibaugh mentioned, just um, going to office hours may be a daunting task, but the peer academic skills consultants can coach you through that. They could also help you um, organize your reading and writing for classes like literature humanities and university writing, or they can help you plan effective study skills for preparing to complete your problem sets. 
Um, lastly, I do want to say that our peer consultants are um, uh, from a variety of student perspectives. So hopefully you'll be able to connect with the one that meets your needs and interests. So now I'd like to turn it back to Nestor. Love. Thank you so much, everyone, for your insights. Uh, so now we will be starting to answer some of the questions that have been coming in. Uh, one question that we've gotten is, when will we find out which section of the core of the core classes we've been assigned? When will they find that out? I can cover that. I do know that our our core office will be um, having students um, pre-registered in these classes by the week of August 14th. It should, should be then. Um, so you'll see these classes on your Virgil slash SSOL registration screen or schedule screen. If you have trouble navigating through those websites, you certainly can reach out directly to your CSA advisor and we can help you manage these websites to find the pre-registered courses. Great. And then do you recommend first years only take additional classes within the core so that they're completed sooner? Uh, taking it within their sophomore year, or does Columbia College recommend taking core across all four years? I think a lot of us could uh, answer that or have an opinion on that, because uh, I'll go back to what a couple of people have said. It really depends. Um, again, if you are a pre-medical student, I imagine this holds true for some of the engineering curriculum. There are several courses you will need to take sooner than later to make sure that you progress toward a pre-medical sequence of classes or toward if you're in a, any of the science majors in general, um, economics, usually people wanna get started right away. There are several where it's just as important to start classes outside the core as to make sure that you are taking the core. Um, for other people who are still exploring, please remember that the core itself is exploration. So by taking core courses, you are touching on several different types of science studies, several different types of humanities oriented things, theories that would be applicable in some of the social sciences. So some people would like to move through their core sequences more uh, early, earlier on in their time. And so you could try to take a global core class or uh, an art humanities class in your first year, as well as taking Lit Hum and University Writing and Frontiers of Science. But again, these are choices. And some of this will depend on whether you already have some firm plans. Some of this will depend on what kind of exploration you wanna do. And see, these are great questions to ask your advisor as you look at what your options are for first semester. Thank you so much for that insight. Uh, the next question we're getting is, what's the difference between a major and a concentration? And does a student declare a major or a concentration or minor at some point? So I'm guessing when would that happen? Uh, and then can that be switched at any point? There's slightly different answers for each school. I, I wonder, Adriana, if you'd like to take this from the Columbia engineering point of view first. Sure, um, so I guess, for the technicalities of the kind of words we're using. So um, concentrations and minors are very similar. They're just used by different schools. So in the college, you'll hear concentration and in engineering, you'll hear minor. Um, but going back to kind of what the major part is, so that's really what the bulk of your curriculum will be focused on, um, the department you're part of. So when Anthony says he is a biomedical engineering major, that's what his bachelor of science will be in. So that's kind of also the way to look at it. Um, and then specifically, for example, our engineers, if you take a minor, um, that's something also that you can declare. Um, it's just not as many classes. So there, for engineering, it's typically about probably five to six courses that you'll take that um, do um, make up whatever that minor is. So for engineers, you can take minors um, that are both other engineering disciplines, but also in the humanities. So we have anything from really all of our academic departments being a minor, but also then race and ethnic studies or certain languages, certain cultures that you could also still minor in. Um, and the point of time that you declare, so for your major, you'll declare the um, fall semester of your sophomore year. So you have a little bit over a year to really explore what you're thinking about majoring in 
Um, but a minor, you can really kind of add on at any point as long as you're getting those courses um, completed in time within your four years. So even if it's junior year, you can still um, work with your CSA advising dean or academic advisor to add that minor um, on top of the major that you're working on already. And if I could jump back in briefly for the college point of view, um, interestingly, a concentration and a minor can be seen as similar in that they could be your secondary course of study after your major. But uh, it's important to know, and this is why it's important always to talk to your advisor about what is specific to your school and your curriculum. Um, a concentration in the college is often a different size. It could be, um, it could have a different focus. And that is because in Columbia College, you can graduate with either a concentration or a major. I will say that the vast majority of our students do have a major. You can have a concentration in addition to a major, but the concentrations can be a little larger and that's because students can graduate with only a concentration. So there is an emphasis the faculty have put on the breadth and depth that those concentrations would have. And then the majors go beyond that in terms of some of the advanced work that they'll do, maybe you'll do a thesis, et cetera. So um, it's important to talk to your advisor about how that all fits together and what seems doable. Um, a secondary course of study can be really exciting to just be able to flesh out additional interests that you have, but some students like the idea of keeping some space for electives so that you might have one major and then you have your core curriculum and then you have space to take other courses that you'll you know, only be able to take as an undergraduate in a liberal arts institution. And so you wanna have space to do that. So whether or not you choose a concentration or a major or both is again, a very individual decision. And I hope you'll talk with lots of people about it. Thanks. I did wanna jump in and say that um, as mentioned, as a Columbia engineer, you will be declaring your major and or minor in the sophomore year fall. And then for Columbia College students, you will be declaring in your sophomore year spring term. But part of the question was, can a student change their, their you know, declared major or concentration or minor? And it, it is true that the answer is yes in general, but say if you're a Columbia engineer and wanted to switch a major, you do have to consult with the faculty advisors within the department that you do want to switch into to ensure that you can finish and complete the major requirements within the duration of time you have remaining. So the four in, within the four years in total. Um, and then you can work with your CSA advisor to process the change of major or change of concentration or change of minor. We do oftentimes notice that when, when seniors are in their senior year, that they actually drop their minor or drop their second program in the college, right? So that is perfectly fine. So you could initially declare two things like in the college um, and then drop a concentration or drop a minor. And we'll work through all of that with you in time. Thank you, everyone. Uh, another question we're getting is when will information about required textbooks um, be available to students uh, and are they available to be purchased at the campus bookstore online? Where do students usually get uh, these required textbooks? This is a great question. Um, if I could offer an observation and I'd love to hear from Paige and Anthony as to how they usually organize themselves at the beginning of each semester. Um, every, uh, I think Anthony mentioned that every class will have a syllabus. So um, on your first day of class, when you go to the first meeting, there will be a syllabus handed out to you that will have not only the plan for the semester, the plan for your assignments. By the way, I'll be going over this again in orientation for all the Columbia College students. So just know that you can hear this information again and again. Um, and it will tell you the textbooks, other materials that would be required for the course. Usually uh, the professor will also tell you where they suggest you buy them or where they've arranged for them to be available. Many people do use the Columbia Bookstore that's on campus in our Learner Student Center. There is also a local bookstore nearby called Book Culture that many um, professors like to use. They also know that a lot of people are going to want to order them online. You can get your books from Amazon. Your professors can also let you know if you need a very specific edition or version of something because sometimes you will all be reading things together in class and you want to be able to turn to the same page in the same translation and know that you're all looking at the same thing 
And then sometimes different versions, different editions, older used versions can be just fine. The material is pretty much the same or consistent. So again, the professors can let you know um, how this works. Some people really love to do things digitally as eBooks. Some professors think that that's fine. Some professors have found that there is there are limitations to that. So it's again, it's a good idea to find out what the different variations of your text materials could be. And then as you think about what works well for you, things that are convenient online aren't always as um, beneficial for studying as something concrete in your hand that you can mark up and things like that. So how you work with materials can vary too. Um, so Paige and Anthony, how do you handle getting your course materials together at the beginning of each semester? Um, I can start off with that word. The biggest piece of advice I would offer is wait until you actually, unless your professor sends ahead of time the list of books they would like you to use for that course, I would wait until you actually attend your first course before purchasing anything. Um, with the exception of the Iliad, I believe, for Literature Humanities, um, as that's usually the first book you'll encounter for um, Literature Humanities, most of these books are very specific to the class. Um, so professors have kind of, as Dean Halbach said, um, specific editions they want and things like that. Some are okay with um, physical editions, some aren't. So it really depends on the professor and it's really great to go to the first class to hear exactly what they're looking for. This is especially important since the first two weeks of classes are what we call a shopping period, where you have a little bit of flexibility in your schedule and you're able to adjust courses as you need um, to meet different requirements or to just um, kind of see if these courses are something that you're interested in. So it is important if you are shopping a class and are not 100% sure if you're going to take that class, don't buy the book ahead of time until you're sure that you're planning to stay in that course. Um, and book culture offers a set for all literature humanities books, but since profs have different needs and different wants with their um, which editions and things like that, they're willing to switch out books for that set that they provide at a discounted rate. So it's also good to go in with that in mind that just because they provide one set and your prof has different needs, um, they can often accommodate those needs. So Anthony, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, yeah, so um, for textbooks, at least, um, so for C's, we're mostly working with a lot of like math textbooks, uh, chemistry textbooks, and biology textbooks. Uh, for, but for the most part, um, so one thing I want to highlight is the Fly Library. So if you are in a Fly student, uh, they would have a resource for you. So you wouldn't have to pay because sometimes books can get expensive. Uh, but like Paige said, definitely look at the, syllab the syllabus and ask the professor if the textbook is a necessity. Um, I have encountered a lot that I have found my textbooks through external sources when I did need it. And oftentimes I did not need it because there are a lot of... Um, there are a lot of things to look after. But so the addition is especially because a lot of classes, at least um, especially for your first couple of years, will use textbooks for their problem sets. And so definitely pay attention to the addition because sometimes your professors could just say, uh, do XXX um, number questions from the X sections um, of a specific textbook. And if you don't have the specific addition, they could vary. Um, and so in order to just keep your cohort, just be cognizant of that. Um, but also just talk to your TAs too, because sometimes you can get books through other means um, that are not just through purchasing or like, um, you can find a PDF online. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, there's tons of ways to get it and it's very doable. But like Paige said, um, so your professors will help you out. Uh, if your, your TAs will help you out, if you need to find the special edition or just finding just access to the books in general, um, but do get textbooks. They are very helpful whenever you need it. It's always good to have more than less. Thank you everyone for your insight. Uh, next question we have, uh, we'll probably have time for a couple more questions. Uh, some classes have uh, prerequisites. So any advice to incoming students who are trying to fulfill the core um, curriculum uh, within the first year. Okay, so uh, classes definitely have prerequisites, and I think that it's very important to to adhere to those prerequisites. Certainly, sometimes people come in with a requisite amount of knowledge, and so 
communicating directly with the, the professor of the course could help um, and to share what your experience is with the, with the material that you think that you're familiar with. But departments, I do want to emphasize in, in the college departments, such as the economics department are very strict with prerequisites. So it's important that you look at the Columbia College Bulletin um, and the, each of the courses that um, comprise majors and concentrations in, in, in including the Columbia Engineering Bulletin will, will list in the course description, the first part of a course description will emphasize the prerequisites. So it's super important to pay attention to that because in the example that I'm sharing regarding the economics major concentration, a student could be penalized for taking a course before taking its prerequisite or co-requisite. So if, if you don't know, um, if, if it isn't clear that a prerequisite is a prerequisite, please reach out to your CSA advisor who can help sort through all of that. Thank you. And then our last question for the day uh, is how early should students express an interest in studying abroad? I can start this one off. Um, so you will be um, working with a couple of different offices if you are looking to study abroad. So there is the Center of Undergraduate Global Engagement. This is really what I usually call as the home of study abroad. Um, but you also will work with your advising dean in CSA um, and possibly also your department um, advisors as well. Um, I would say the sooner, definitely the better. Uh, speaking for the point of Columbia Engineering, really the sweet spot of going abroad um, is the spring of your sophomore year. So this will happen right after you declare. Um, so you'll know what your major is at that point, but it's also um, before you get into too many of your really tech heavy um, math and science courses for that engineering curriculum. So that's really um, the time for our engineers, that's the best to go abroad, um, but you'll really be planning that semester before and getting your approvals the semester before pretty early on. Um, so it's definitely not something you have to plan out right now, but definitely starting that summer after your first year um, for our engineers is typically helpful just to start that research of where do you want to go, um, what classes maybe do you want to take abroad, um, so you kind of know your timeline of the application process because you do need to be accepted at that abroad institution and just make sure all your clearances are in place um, at Columbia as well, specifically through global engagement. Um, that's also a service my office in engineering student affairs we also offer. So I've sat down with students to kind of plan out what that looks like. Um, so we're just an additional research that can resource that can also really help you through that process. Um, so I would definitely say the earlier the better. Um, just make sure all your ducks are in a row, especially as you get closer to when that actual trip would happen. And I'll just speak from the, the college side, because again, the timing is slightly different. Um, in the sophomore year, all Columbia College students take the year long course, Contemporary Civilization. And so it's a long tradition that students take that course together here on campus the entire sophomore year. So our sweet spot is a little different. Our sweet spot tends to be junior year when students go abroad. And again, but one thing that is similar is that it really kind of depends on what your particular course of studies are. So if you are a science major or you, or you do have things that have a particular sequence, you do want to talk with advisors early on about when you must be in classes on campus and when you have some flexibility to study abroad. You might also think about this. This goes to the question that several people have asked about when should I take my core classes? Should I take them sooner? Should I take them later? This might have something to do with that. Some students wait to take their courses for the global core requirement for when they go abroad or 